And welcome to this edition of Trader Talk TV. Today we have Tama from Critio in the office. How are you doing, Tama? Good. Thanks for having me. Tama and I are going to talk about the two biggest subjects in ad tech, i.e. commerce media, and its closely uh, related cousin, retail media. Uh, and Tama is going to give us a rundown on, on the Critio stack and a little bit more about the definitions of both. Uh, Critio is very much the uh, king in waiting, queen in waiting, person in waiting, uh, in terms of the retail media mm -hmm. uh, piece. So, Thomas, thank you very much for coming in today. Before we kick off in terms of talking about the Critio stack, because people are very interested in seeing how that works, uh -huh. can you just give us an overview of what, how you see commerce media versus retail media and how they're connected? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, I think, you know, for us, retail media has been something we've been doing for six years now. And I think the way I would describe it, it's, it's kind of a simple story, really, is as a retailer, you you know, as you go online and as you're having this new kind of e-commerce channel, your margin profile becomes trickier, right? You need to pay for servers, engineers, new distribution channels. That has a cost impact, right, mm -hmm. on your margin structure. So you need to offset that in some shape or form. And so what you see retailers doing and what they've been doing for the past few years is fundamentally saying, how do I replicate some of what I've been doing offline in the digital world, right? So typically that's going to be let's say this is a, a retail website, this is a digital shelf, right? This looks, like, this looks exactly like an actual shelf in the store. And so what happens if I actually put up for grabs various placements that, you know, the brands that I typically work with that potentially have trade relationships with, uh, you know, would they be okay buying that? Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, we know that's been, you know, working. So that's broadly speaking what we would define as retail media. So very retail activity, typically endemic brands. So think about a Procter & Gamble, think about you know, a Unilever. So very traditional trade relationship, mm -hmm. but actually happening on a digital channel that the retailer owns. Now, when you think about commerce media, right, which I think is the cousin, like you're saying, it's anything that goes a bit beyond that, but it's mm -hmm. fundamentally anchored in this type of relationship, or um, I would say asset. So when you think about the retailer, expanding the relationship that they might have uh, with these brands. Maybe it's not only going to be, so we were saying, endemic demand, right? So people that actually sell products on the website. Maybe it's going to be, I'm opening these same inventory to non-endemic, right? So now maybe I want to bring in a bank, an insurance company, a yeah. car company. So yeah. that's a new way. You could also imagine saying, well, I'm going to use data from this retail website and actually use that for open, well. right, for open web. Mm -hmm. How do I expand the relationship I can have with this brand using my data and not just my inventory? And last but not least, you see this model being replicated by anybody else that does have a footprint online and does see transaction data. And so that's going to be anywhere from a delivery company, travel companies, right, other folks that are specifically retail, but that can replicate this model. And so that's what we broadly see as you know, the difference between right. the, the original right. retail media and okay. kind of what it's spinning into, I would say. So just the definition in retail media effectively is like a, you know, Asda, Sainsbury's, Carrefour, yeah. Walmart, whatever, um, looking to serve ads on their own site, serve advertising on their own marketing yeah. uh, to, to, to the users on the site. And almost as a kind of like a, a an extension of the in-store marketing piece. Yeah. So it's like incremental sort of spend uh, in terms of growing that uh, that pot of revenue from those in marketing spenders, and then obviously commerce media is sort of an expansion of that. You can look at applying that model to uh, Uber or a Deliveroo or yep. something else who's going to have first party data or retail or transactional data that can be used elsewhere. And then there's the element of like targeting off site. They will take that data off and yep. then like retargeting or you know, some other sort of like um, packaged up data driven campaign. So, so that, that, that's an interesting sort of definition that the, that's clear enough. In terms of Critio, because obviously, you know, you as a company, you've done a lot of, your business was predominantly retargeting mm -hmm. back in the day, but you've sort of pivoted into a sort of a retail media infrastructure player or a mm -hmm. commerce media infrastructure player. I want to talk about that because a lot of people would be interested to know about how Critio's tech Mm -hmm. Power someone like Asda, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. um, big retailer in the UK, you know, has has a lot of reach. Like, how do you walk? Just give mm -hmm. us an instance of how you walk 
with that uh, entity. What exactly are you doing with them? How you sort of build um, specific technology for them? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. I mean, interestingly enough, right, like the reason we got into the retail media space six years ago is, you know, our DNA, right? Like yeah. you were saying, it's fundamentally performance, it's fundamentally advertising, of course, but it's fundamentally retail. And so that was kind of our way in. And I think, as you'll see, you know, the technology kind of evolved from there. Mm. And so when you think about, you know, this piece being really, you know, the on-site bread and butter of the retailer, that's kind of where we started because this is predominantly where every retailer kind of starts. And then we just built from there. And so if we kind of map out, you know, what a retailer needs as they launch their program and as they want to grow their program, the first kind of basic piece that you're going to need is this is my website. I need some sort of ad server. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily need to be smart. It doesn't, you know, it needs to serve ads yes. in the very yes. basic way. That's the first requirements you have. That's your core, basically. Yeah, that's your, right. you know, the first campaign that you're putting on your website. It is new for you, right? Yeah. You're fundamentally a retail business. You're trying to optimize for sales. Mm. And now you're, you're getting something that isn't organic content, mm. right? So this is going to be you know, your ad serving piece and, you know, we'll, we'll see how that this can be made smarter, how this can really integrate with your technology as a mm. retailer, but that's the first piece. I think as you begin, you know, scaling a bit more, you have more campaigns, you do want to make sure that you're not always manually assigning a campaign to a context, a page, right? Because this is tedious. You need some sort of automation. You need some sort of supply logic that actually lets you run multiple campaigns on your website yeah. without disrupting your yeah. core business, right? Yeah. So when you think about it, this is what I would call some sort of SSP type of stack yeah. where you're fundamentally saying, I want to make sure anything that goes through here is the right format, latency is taken care of, uh, it gets to the right page without me having to be involved, right? So there's some sort of relevancy logic that is inherent to retail. Because again, as a retailer, my goal is to sell products, not to sell ads. And so I need to convince my organization internally that putting these ads on the website isn't detrimental to actually driving, you know, consumer value, mm. and, you know, selling more baskets. Mm -hmm. And as we continue moving up, right, I think the last piece, as, as you can imagine, is more demand side components. Right. Because effectively, the same way that, you know, the retail website is different from a traditional publishers, what a Procter & Gamble or Unilever is trying to do with this inventory and data is very different, mm. right? So if you're running ads on Asda, you actually have a unique asset, which is I know that someone actually converted on Asda, right, as a result of the advertising. And so I'm going to want to see specific reporting. Maybe I only want to push specific products that actually belong to a catalog. And so there's tons of these things all the way throughout the stack that are so inherently tied to the reality of a retail business. That's kind of what we've built over the years. Can I talk about a couple of acquisitions, acquisitions sure. you made, right? So I, I, I'll dive into some of the attribution piece, but... You bought a company called Hook Logic um, yeah. uh, many, many years ago. Yeah. How did it fit into this? Because that was a product listing, uh, uh, um, ad server in many ways. Yeah. You know, tuck product listed on a site. Very good company, mm -hmm. uh, smart acquisition. But how does that fit in? Is that a key part of what you do for for some of the retailers? Yeah, I mean, it still very much is. I think you know the core assets and kind of knowledge that we acquired through Hook Logic was you know an ad server built for retail. Yeah. And, you know, some capabilities that resemble what I was talking about yeah. from a supply side point of view. So when you think about this is going to be specific formats and a way mm -hmm. to integrate with the mm -hmm. website, right? Mm -hmm. Because fundamentally, if I'm a retailer, I need this to be super native, right? If it's going to yeah. be Ingrid, like it, it can't look like anything else. Yeah. From a supply perspective, what already existed in the Hook Logic stack was anything that looks like relevancy, right? So what are the algorithms making sure that, you know, you're typing TV? We need to show you something that is consistent with what you're asking for. We can be showing you a yogurt. Right? And that sounds dumb, but you need to kind of build it out right? from a tech point of view. Um, other than that, I think it's really been kind of what are the models that we use to optimize for campaigns, right? Historically, Hook Logic was very much a bottom funnel, sponsor products, kind mm. of bread and butter type mm. of, of deal. You need that to perform, right? You want, as, a, as an advertiser, to see sales coming in. You want to optimize for sales, potentially the size of your basket as opposed to just clicks. So that's been kind of the, the last part of this initial technology, which was very point solution focused, if mm. you will, to say, I want to drive sales with native banners that looks like products. Yeah. Right. So I've been talking to a couple of people about the, the retail media space, like consultants who are working with big retailers. And there is a big sort of like 
um, push back against sort of na- like uh, standardized units, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. A lot of them are very uh, consumer focused. You know, the UX is everything to them. So, you know, you, you obviously work with the likes of Asda building native units that look seamless and par- as part of the, the customer mm-hmm. uh, experience as opposed to like, here's a bloody video ad yeah. right in your face. How do you like, um, how, do you, how do you build that into your proposition for a buyer to, like, to look at it? Because like, a lot of buyers want standardization, right? They want, mm-hmm. you know, IAB units so they can just basically buy at scale. So how do you actually, you know, balance that out in terms of like the, the beautiful UX of an ASDA, right? And the product listings on the site that are kind of like built into the design of the site against, you know, your standardized IAB units. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, always going to be the tug of war kind of thing yeah. that we see between the demand side and the supply side. When you think about it, right, like all of our brands and agencies, they're asking us, okay, I want to be doing more on Asda's website or with their data. Is Asda okay with that? And so yeah. I think there, there's a bit of, you know, there is a tech element to it, but the commercial discussion is fundamentally how do we broker some sort of agreement of how we should be able to transact? And obviously the more the retailer gives to some extent in terms of control, the more investments they're going to attract. Mm-hmm. Likewise, right, like the, the more the brand is limited in what they're able to do, the less they're going to want to spend. And so you, you see this dynamic of retailers pushing the boundary of what was okay two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, and giving more control. But then you, you mentioned video, not already they want to explore that. Mm. Uh, control over what audiences am I actually showing something mm. to, right? And so that is slowly coming in. Um, but effectively, I think... You know, that's the relationship we see. And so anything that we built on the demand side needs to be, to some extent, agreed by on the supply side. Because yeah, yeah. fundamentally, is what we cannot have happen is a retailer saying, this has gone over the line. I cannot condone this, right? Because fundamentally, my goal is to sell products. And so that's always the, the balance we need yeah. to keep between the supply components we build and the control that we give them with the demand side. So let's talk about the data piece, right? Because yeah. obviously, uh, retailers are very, very... I'm rightly so conscious about data yeah. leakage and data privacy. How do you square that up in terms of like what your demand side wants versus what a retailer is prepared to put out, right? So I imagine it's probably mostly first party data segments that you've got in the, in the, yeah. in the, in the box. But how do you manage that? Because, you know, obviously being an ad tech stack, mm-hmm. you have to be able to sort of like, you know, uh, counter for that. Like, you know, yeah. if the retailer says, oh, well, I want to have native units, I want to have you know, uh, um, the ability to, to, to plug into the demand side, but I don't want to have my data out yeah. on the open web or yeah. in, in open bid streams. Yeah. I mean, interesting enough, like when you look at what's happened over the last six years, like the market really is changing as the retailers are maturing and accepting that they can do more and it's safe for them to do so. Yeah. So when you th- think about Hook Logic, right, like what they were selling was fundamentally a network of retailers, yeah. but very important, it was a blind one, right? Yeah, so yeah, effectively, yeah. as a brand, I'm just putting budget, and I'm hoping, right, that it's actually going to the right retailer and yeah. performing correctly, but I don't have any visibility into that. I don't have any control over budget allocation. So the first kind of big move was saying, no, we're actually going to give, you know, control and transparency. And so that was something we did three years ago that effectively open the floodgates for brands to say, okay, now I can actually say this is my budget for Asda, this is my budget for Sainsbury's, and I do feel that I have much more control, so I feel more enticed to actually spend more. Um, I think the next steps is, you know, measurement has always been the the core underlying asset here. Mm. So if I'm a retailer, whether I'm giving my data transparently or not, I'm saying if the sale happened as a result of an ad, I think the next step is going to be How do I enable new use cases that are potentially more demand-led, right? Like user-level decisioning, audience type of of plays, uh, while, you know, pre-protecting myself for anything that looks like data leakage that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. So let's use an example, right? Let's assume I actually want to do, you know, audience targeting. Yeah. Whether this is, you know, a CRM segment, whether this is leveraging some of my in-store assets that are, you know, unique, right, in market. How do I do that? without fundamentally giving the audience away to someone. Because once I give it once, it's basically out there, right? And so everything that we've built for retailers is how do we actually have a fully kind of integrated stack that lets the demand come in in kind of this environment that is in and of itself 
you know, a safe environment built by the retailer or for the retailer, right? Where they can transact, but without kind of going away. And so that's been the dynamic of saying, okay, we're actually gonna build all these things within our platform. So creating an audience, onboarding CRM data, onboarding in-store sales, all of that needs to be done within kind of Credio's ecosystem because that's what the retailer trusts, right? They don't necessarily want that to, to go into other industry tools. Are the retailers coming to you to help monetize their all of their inventory. So let's just talk about, you know, no. I imagine there's two, two types of advertisers here, right? There is the trade sale advertisers, right? Mm -hmm. Which the teams within ASDA are selling to on, on, on in-store marketing. So here's a bucket of cash. Let's put up some like, you know, uh, some nice marketing on the aisles. Here's a couple of pages in the magazine, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, they're selling into them to get more budget, right? Yep. And that, it would probably generally be IOs or, or, some, or, yep. so, or, or some sort of like, you know, direct sold. And then there's the advertisers outside, you know, agencies mm -hmm. or even Critio advertisers themselves yep. looking to access that data and then having like that full funnel attribution, right? Top of the funnel, mm -hmm. mid funnel, and then actually a sale of the product. So you can yep. like have a proper attribution model. Yep. Are you doing both? Uh, or are you doing more of this demand side piece from the agencies and, and the Critio advertisers? Um, I would say that there is kind of a consolidation play, mm. right, for all retailers as you know they realize this is even more strategic for them, and you know they, they yield management, etc. I mean, it's yeah. both yield management, the type of inventory they actually expose, or the type of play they go after. Right? Yeah. Like, as you know, they reach saturation on their website, for example. Yeah. And now they, they need to get CPMs up or go upside, so they they have multiple tactics they can mm. employ, mm. and I think because of the technical complexity of getting it right, but also because they want to make it easy for brands and agencies to buy from them, yeah. they need to consolidate that to some extent. Because yeah. if there's 10 different ways to buy from Asda or Tesco, okay, that's complex, right? Like as yeah, a brand, yeah, as an yeah. agency, I'm, I'm gonna have a campaign manager that has 20 different tools that don't have the same logic, you know, consistency measurement maybe doesn't look the same. So yeah. you wanna consolidate that for lots of reasons. And so what, what we find is that, you know, we really started, right, if we go back to our WeTel website, you know, we did start um, with, you know, very basic, let's say, sponsor product ads. And yeah. This was, you know, what yeah. Hooklogic did really well. Uh, we acquired a company called Store Retail. That was a French-based company that okay. effectively did outside display, whether mm. IAB or a bit more native, right? Yeah. But something slightly more upper funnel. And so what you're seeing is, you know, effectively what we do for our retailers is we keep kind of expanding what we do for them, right? As we earn their trust and as they recognize the results, uh, you know, we basically get asked to do more, right? So now we actually have retailers saying, I want you to build an offsite stack, or right, I want right. you to investigate video, I want you to investigate yeah, yeah, new yeah. things that fundamentally have always been part of the picture, but now I want to go to the next level with respect to scaling that. And that's a different challenge than doing so it once. So there's a lot right? of product innovation going on in terms of the site, like what's non-intrusive, what's actually part of the site, what can I do yeah. in video, for instance, these are stuff like you know conversational media ads and all that kind of stuff. That's yeah. kind of cool, uh, AI stuff. Um, so so that, that, that's fascinating. So you, you think that we're at this very early stage in terms of like you guys are coming in. You've done. You've got the hook logic. You've got a bunch of other. Um, I don't the name of that French company again. Yes, uh, storytelling. Storytelling. Yes, sorry, yeah. and you've got all these bits and pieces that sort of add to that stack. But do you think ultimately you're going to have a consolidation of the entire stack because it's great for like, you know standardizing ad units like even if asda has these specific units at least it's on the same ad i can buy across asda and the, and, and the ux is sort of built as one rather than you know one part here one part there mm -hmm. so you think that will become consolidated into one stack and that's probably where the likes of criteria come into play yeah i mean like what i see from any of our existing clients or any kind of request for proposals that we see from prospects yeah more and more it is kind of an all-encompassing kind of holistic play, yeah. right? They're not looking for a point solution or something, yeah, yeah, right? No. It's really, how do I do more? And even if the technology isn't fully ready or even if mm. it's exploratory, they want and they're looking for partners that can actually help them scale across yeah. the whole program because otherwise it's just too complex, right? Yeah, if you're yeah, a yeah, retailer, absolutely. like you're not, you're not a tech company, right? Yeah. So fundamentally, the amount of resources that you have, even if this is strategic for you, is still limited. So you want to make sure you choose the right person mm. that can actually help you grow. And so... I think what's interesting for, for us and for all the discussions that we have is seeing kind of where retailers are in their journey. And we do have ones that are still very much starting that journey and they're trying to get to their first million. 
others that are trying to get to the 10 million mark, mm. 100. And so when you think about it, right, um, the challenges that you get are fundamentally different. And so, you know, the, the way I kind of look at it, it's kind of a plateau thing or, you know, like a scale thing where you're starting here, you do your first million, then you try to get to 10, then to 100, then to 1,000. I think, you know, we've had the experience of actually helping retailers at every single stage. Mm. But fundamentally, right, if you're here, it's I need an ad server. Yeah. Right? And we were talking about that. I need to be able to serve ads. If you're getting to the 10 million, okay, like measurement is very much important. It actually needs to work. I need to prove the performance. Otherwise, people are not going to come back. So it's kind of operational tooling or, you know, analytics uh, type of tools, if you will. Um, so let's say, let's put measurement here. If you're trying to get to 100 million, now you have tons of other challenges where, okay, you might become inventory constrained. So what does your yield management look like? How do you actually automate all of that? Because like yeah. 100 millions of campaigns is a ton of campaigns. Yeah. Billing becomes being an issue. It's like you have these things. Um, so let's put a few of this here, billing, uh, automation. You could definitely put self-service as well because the yeah. reality is even as a retailer that's massive like an Asda or Care4, yeah. you can't hire 150 people. That, yeah. That's not going to happen. Um, so these are kind of new challenges that you have. And if you really want to have fun and get into the billion range, okay, now you're fundamentally competing against it's not even against retailers, you're competing against you know, Meta, Google, whoever. It's like, okay, what is my value prop? How do I differentiate? What are my key assets in terms of data that can actually come into play? Mm. In-store sales, CRM segments, all of that, right? It's funny that your, uh, your CEO was on an earnings uh, uh, call this week and she described you guys as the open, uh, Amazon for the open web. I think, that's, yeah. that, I think that's fair, but I think it's better, I think, to call you guys double click for retail, right? If you think about it, you're that, um, advertising marketing layer um, for the retail space. And like when I look at this, I think like, you know, you're talking about the full stack. Doubleclick came in and did buy side, sell side and built all the bit yeah. pieces in between and actually was able to put that together, which I think it's a, a interesting, the interesting sort of a, a metaphor for what you guys are doing. I think that Amazon are a wall of garden and a media business first. I don't think like ad tech second really. Yeah, I mean, I think I think both can be true, right? Yeah. I, I would argue like when you think about the, who we target, the CEO of a public company. In fairness, like, you know. <laughs> I mean, when you think about the retail landscape, the reality, right? Like, let's take for a country like the UK, right? Like, let's imagine that's your retail landscape. There's going to be some Amazon here that's taking a huge yeah. chunk, and they're big enough to have their own tech, 100%. and they, they've built right. That's fine. Then you're going to have a few. You know, massive retailers, are they big enough? Do they have the technical chops to build their own stack? Mm, probably, probably not, no. but is, are they legitimate enough to say, no, I'm, I own 20% of the UK market, yeah. so I need something unique. And by the way, I still have this gravitational pull that yeah. says people are going to come to me. And so that's kind of the, the tug of war game that I yeah. was speaking about. So they're not necessarily going to build their own tag, but they do want someone to build it for them. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's very much where we come in. And then, right, like... Then you've you got the sort of like second tier retailers. Exactly. I don't mean that in derogatory, but like they're big, but they're not big enough. Ex to kind of exactly. Like, like, like together, they still very much have as much data as Amazon. Mm -hmm. But the question is, how do we make that inventory data, mm -hmm. you know, palatable and kind of easy to consume? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where, right, like you have the top retailers that want to become Amazon to yeah. some extent and want yeah. to replicate that. And then the others is how do we become something a bit more of a network that they can, you know, be a part of to really benefit from this, this trend, right? Yeah. And so I think these are different approaches, but yeah. very consistent. Because on the other side, the reality is today the demand, regardless of whether they're big brands or small brands, we know they're over-indexed on Amazon spend. And so they're and trying to see how do I address meta. this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they're trying to figure out how do I address this? Yeah. And because the reality yeah. is like the customers are there on Tesco's, Asda, yeah. Sainsbury's, Boots, and all the sort of like even the second tier sort of retailers. And they're going, well, we want to spend money there. So where's the infrastructure to make that happen? Exactly. Right. Okay. Exactly. And I think it's going to be, you know, I mean, the inventory itself, right? Like when you start on the website, like that's the obvious piece. But I yeah. think where Amazon very much has a head start and everybody's trying to catch up is, okay, how do I use my data to go offsite? How do I really have an audience play? How do yeah. I use my in-store yeah. sales that Amazon doesn't have? And so I think everybody's trying to wrap their head around that. I think five years ago, all the discussions we had with retailers were very opportunistic, mm. right? Like they saw a way to make a quick buck and that was great. Now it's really strategic. And so they're really saying, okay, where do we need to be in five to 10 yeah. years to compete in this game? Because this is essential for us. Yeah, so this is a decade long. So myself and Megan were actually right. Um, so Corvball, we'll ask Corvball for you, uh -huh. because actually you've done a great job explaining that full stack thing. 
your recent acquisition of Open Web, yep. where do they fit into this uh, conversation? Because that was quite a big, chunky acquisition. Like, is that is that more about the, the sort of infrastructure layer, um, like, or, or or even like the offsite piece? Particularly, they've got BidSwitch and mm-hmm. they've got a few other sort of uh, really interesting assets. Yeah, I mean, when I you know when you think about it from a you know retail media or commerce media overall lens, I think there's two kind of great places where they fit. One is you know, they've built a ton of programmatic kind of pipeline, pipeline yeah. or, or tech overall. And the reality is that very much underpins tons of stuff our retailers are doing today, right? So if you're Asda, maybe you're going to be using Google Ad Manager to serve, mm. you know, kind of non-endemic programmatic demand. Okay, how do we actually make sure we in-house some of that piping and build it with what you have for your endemic demand or like your existing yeah. native? So basically part of that stack consolidation. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, right? Yeah. So I think that's part of it and that's the very kind of immediate thing that we do want to get to yeah another one is saying all right like as ultimately inventory is going to dry up as you want to compete with meta google whoever yeah. for other buckets of budgets we need to make sure that we can actually take your first party data which is your unique asset mm-hmm. and actually take that somewhere else mm. and so making sure we resolve identity challenges for yeah. you right making sure we get access to inventory at scale yeah to make sure you know we take this value prop in other places that your own kind of o and o inventory yeah that is also what you know i think uh, ip on web's technology and skill set help us do so anything programmatic which is kind of the next step yeah. Right. That is what's going to be useful, uh, and I think it, it's very much like the evolution of the market we've seen for overall like basic mm-hmm. digital advertising, mm-hmm. where you start with very basic ad serving and kind of PMPs, if you will, into okay, what's the next step of that to make it more connected, easier, etc. Of course, you got yeah. Boris as well. It's always nice. Yes, that's always a pretty good asset to have. Yeah, Tom, thank you very much for that run through. That was really, really interesting. I think like we, we have a ten year journey ahead of us here. I think we're only starting out on this on this sort of like uh, sort of like um, journey around retail media and sort of monetizing the opportunity around it. So yeah. thank you for bringing us through today. Yeah, my pleasure. I look forward to uh, seeing where this is going. Oh yeah, um, we'll have you back and we'll, we'll go over this next year. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, the transition and the progress. Uh, thanks, Tama. And that was Trader Talk TV, and we will see you next time.